For the last few weeks we've been studying about Jerusalem and a patch of ground 15 furlong square, which is about four square miles or 2,500 acres, known as the King's Dale, which goes from the eastern gate of Jerusalem to Bethany, Nob, Anatot, and Gion. And the more I study the history of this patch of ground, the more fascinated I become with it. Going back as far as archaeology can currently take us, the first settlement that we know of on the King's Dale was at Gion where, not surprisingly, there is a plentiful source of clean water, the Gion Spring. And in Hebrew, that name, uh, Nayon Gion, literally means the spring of the virgin, or the fountain of the virgin. Now, I don't know about you, but to my mind, that points us in the right direction from the word go because I'm inclined to receive that information as prophetic, because Christ was born of a virgin, and he himself died a virgin. And in Zechariah 12, and uh, 9 through 10, 13, 1, and 6, 14, 3, and 8, and 9, I know that was clear as mud there, that reference, uh, we find the following, And it shall come to pass in that day, that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. And someone will ask him, What are these wounds in your hands? And he will answer, These are the wounds I was given at the house of my friends. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. And it shall be in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem." The Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day there will be one Lord, His name, the only name. And it was these words in Zechariah 13.1 that inspired William Cowper to write the hymn, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. And all this is foreshadowed by the fact that the very ground that would one day be a wash in the blood of the Lord was first named the Fountain of the Virgin, which fountain still to this day supplies the city of Jerusalem with fresh water. The next time in the course of history when Jerusalem comes to the fore is when it is mentioned in the execration text of the Egyptian Middle Kingdom, where the city that overlooks the King's Dale is referred to is, uh, is referred to as Rusalamim, the city of peace. And it's the same city, the city of peace, over which Melchizedek was king. And it was on the King's Dale, about 150 years thence, that Melchizedek intercepted Abraham as he was returning victorious from the War of the Nine Kings, known in secular history as the Battle of Sedim. And there Melchizedek confirmed his sacerdotal authority over Abraham when he gave Abraham bread and wine and blessed him and then forthrightly received from Abraham a tithe of all that he had. And not too many years after this, Abraham returned to Jerusalem at the behest of the Lord. Genesis 22, 1 through 2, After these things God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on a certain mountain I will show you. And Abraham obeyed the Lord and took his son Isaac to the appointed place, and there bound him and placed him on the altar. Then picking up in verse 10 of Genesis 22, Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, 
seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And where did this happen? Where did Abraham prove his faithfulness to the Lord? At Mount Moriah, Jerusalem. This, according to Second Chronicles 3.1 where we're told, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. And this is when uh, Jerusalem was consecrated unto Israel. This is when Jerusalem became a holy city in the hearts and minds of Abraham and all his descendants. Then about 150 years later, in 1700 B.C., Jerusalem was occupied by the Hyksos, a nation of kings from Western Asia who 50 years later made their way to Egypt and infiltrated the aristocracy there, becoming part of the ruling class of Egypt. And in 1550 B.C., Jerusalem became a vassal of Egypt under the rule of the Hyksos kingdom of Egypt. And the city remained officially under Egyptian rule for the next 400 years or so. However, the degree of control actually exercised by Egypt over that region seems to have been slight at best, because in 1300 B.C., when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, the arm of their strength did not seem to reach even as far as into the Sinai Peninsula. And a generation later, when Joshua led the Israelites into the Promised Land, they occupied it, and though they were met with resistance, the resistance was from the local people, not from Egypt. At the time of the conquest of the children of Israel, Jerusalem, according to secular history, was ruled by Abdi Hebda, a Canaanite ruler, to whom the city was known as uh, Urusalim. And in the occupation by the Israelites, Jerusalem was settled by the tribe of Benjamin. Now you might think that once Benjamin had possession of the city of peace, they would have held on to it. But they didn't. No, in 1010 B.C., when King David attacked and captured Jerusalem, it was under the control of a local tribe, the Jebusites, who had changed the name uh, of the city to Jebus. But when David occupied the city, he renamed it the City of David and made it the capital of the United Kingdom of Israel. And it was under David's reign that the Ark of the Covenant, for the first time, came to have a fixed resting place in Jerusalem. A generation later, it was on the King's Dale at Gion, where Solomon was anointed king, at the fountain of the Virgin in the Kidron Valley, the Valley of Coronation. Then, in 962 B.C., Solomon built the first temple at Jerusalem, and God took up residence in Solomon's temple and dwelt there among his people. As we read in Second Chronicles 7, 1 through 3, As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord, because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. But thirty years later Solomon died, and when he died the kingdom split, and Jerusalem became the capital of the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. And within a decade of Solomon's death, Jerusalem was overtaken by the Egyptians. But the Egyptians were relatively merciful and did not destroy the city, but let them live in peaceful subjection to Egypt. As we read in Second Chronicles 12, 9 through 12, So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. He took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took away everything. He also took away the shields of gold that Solomon had made. And King Rehoboam made in their place shields of bronze and committed them to the hand of the officers of the guard who kept the door of the king's house. And as often as the king went into the house of the Lord, the guard came and carried them and brought them back to the guard room. And when he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him so as not to make a complete destruction. Accordingly, conditions were good 
in Judah. And for the next 200 years or so, while Jerusalem was officially a vassal of Egypt, things went pretty much apace in that city. Now there were a couple of incursions during that time. At one point the Philistines raided the city of David, robbed the palace, and ran off with most of the royal family. But they didn't stick around for long. And about 20 years after that, King Hazael of Aram, Damascus, decided he wanted to be the biggest kid on the block and started demanding protection money from everyone else in Canaan. Jehoash, king of Judah, paid the tribute, but Hazael killed him and his family anyway. However, he didn't take over the city. In 786 BC, Jehoash of the northern kingdom uh, of the northern kingdom did pretty much the same to Amaziah. Then, in 733 BC, Pekah of the northern kingdom and his friend Rezin, king of Aram, made a number of attempts to do the same to Ahaz. And here's where things in Jerusalem took a turn, because God sent Isaiah to assure Ahaz that Pekah and Rezin were nothing but pests and that Jerusalem would come to no harm by their hands. But Ahaz was a bad king who had completely rejected the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and consequently Isaiah's words didn't have much sway with him. So he ignored the king's assurances and appealed instead to Tiglath-Pileser III of Assyria for help. And because of this, Jerusalem became a vassal of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. And it was in the midst of this debacle that Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 1, 21 through 27, how the faithful city has become a whore. She who was, fa- uh, who was full of justice, righteousness had once lodged in her, but now she has become the haunt of murderers. Your silver has become dross, your best wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not bring justice to the fatherless, and the widow's cause does not come to them. Therefore, the Lord declares, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, surely I will get relief from my enemies and avenge myself on my foes. I will turn my hand against you and will smelt away your dross as with lye and remove all your alloy. And I will restore your judges as at the first, and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed by justice, and those in her who, and those in her who repent by righteousness. And this brings us to the brink of the point that I want to try to make this morning. You see, so far in this lesson, we've covered almost 4,000 years of the history of Jerusalem. And so far, its history has been mostly peaceful. For the first 2,500 years of its existence, there's no evidence of any warfare, battles, or conquests involving Jerusalem. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, in the War of the Nine Kings, Jerusalem went unscathed. Every kingdom on every side of Jerusalem was involved in that war, but Melchizedek watched it unfold from the hill of Zion, from the placid eye of the storm. Moreover, when the Hyksos came along, they were more like presumptive rulers than conquerors. It was in their nature to assert themselves and to take charge of things. And they did this everywhere they went, first in Canaan and then 150 years later in Egypt. But the Hyksos were political operators more so than military operators. And their role in Palestine was largely administrative. And under their administration, Jerusalem was relatively peaceful. No, it wasn't until the 13th century BC that the Promised Land had any real taste of blood. And that was at the hands of the children of Israel when they invaded under the leadership of Joshua and occupied it for themselves. That's when Jerusalem, according to the Bible, became the possession of its rightful owners. Now, the children of Israel were not good stewards of the land. And after the first few conquests, they did not obey the Lord. The Lord had told them to clear the land 
of its inhabitants. But instead, for the most part, the Israelites just moved in and shared the land with its native occupants. So, having never fully asserted their sovereignty over the land, it's no wonder that 200 years later, when David came along, Jerusalem was no longer under the control of the Benjaminites, as it should have been, but of the Jebusites, one of the very nations God had told the people to erase from the landscape. However, the Jebusites hadn't seized the city by force. They had taken over it slowly, by attrition. But David exercised the sovereignty of Israel over Jerusalem aright, and not only took it back from the Jebusites, but made it the capital of the kingdom of Israel and made it his personal headquarters, giving it the sobriquet, the city of David. Then, after the death of of Solomon, Jerusalem lost much of its prestige, but it remained occupied by the children of Israel right up through the regency of Ahaz. But during the reign of Ahaz, the faithlessness of the children of Israel and of their king reached a degree that was no longer tolerable to God. And God said to Jerusalem, You and I have some unfinished business. You are clearly not fit to be called the city of justice. You are clearly not ready to be called the faithful city. So there are going to be some changes around here, and those changes are going to take place in you. And he evoked the language of the refiner's fire, saying, I will turn my hand against you and will smelt away your dross as with lye and remove all your alloy. And understanding this is vitally important for grasping the current status of Jerusalem before God in the present. You see, in Luke 21, 24, Jesus speaks of the fall of Jerusalem, saying, Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And Paul also refers to the time of the Gentiles in Romans eleven twenty five, saying, A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, there's a general agreement among Bible scholars about when, uh, excuse me, when it comes to the question of when the time of the Gentiles will come to an end, it will terminate when Christ returns on the last day. And there's near unanimous agreement that we are living in the time of the Gentiles right now. But there's some disagreement over when the time of the Gentiles began. Some are persuaded that the time of the Gentiles began with Peter's rooftop vision in Acts 10 and the evangelism of non-Jews by the early church. But I don't think that's right. Because in Luke 21, 24, Jesus isn't talking about the kingdom of God. He's talking about the city of Jerusalem, the geographical city of Jerusalem. And he defines the time of the Gentiles as the oppressive occupation of that city by Gentile powers. And that occupation didn't begin in the first century. It didn't begin with the uh, destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. either. It began when the prophecy of, of Isaiah in Isaiah 1 began to be fulfilled. Because 20 years after Ahaz turned to tiglath Pileser rather than to God, Jerusalem began to come under serious attack. First, the Assyrians laid siege to the city, but they averted destruction by uh, becoming a vassal of King Sennacherib of Assyria. And later the Egyptians laid siege, laid siege to the hill of Zion, and again the Jerusalemites capitulated and survived as vassals of Pharaoh Necho II of Egypt. But in 605 BC the Babylonians showed up on their doorstep and they were playing for keeps. Nebuchadnezzar II occupied Jerusalem and the city of God has been under the rule of Gentiles ever since. For the last 2,600 years, that city has been in the refiner's fire, being refined by the adversity of the time of the Gentiles. Now, the book of Daniel records a series of visions dealing with the Gentile world powers and their role in God's plan for redemptive history. And a number of people have attempted to identify the kings in these visions, I've made no such attempt, but noting that in each vision the Gentiles are given dominion over the world, 
including the Jewish people, for a time until God ultimately subdues them all and establishes his own kingdom once and for all, I am persuaded that the time of the Gentiles includes all the years between the Babylonian, the Babylonian Empire of Nebuchadnezzar and the return of Christ in clouds of glory on the day of the Lord, and that we're now living in the time of the Gentiles. And this is corroborated by the fact that for all that time, Jerusalem has been in the crucible, being refined by the refiner's fire. As God had said, I will turn my hand against you, and I will smelt away your dross as with lye, and remove all your alloy. And all signs point to the likelihood that this will continue for the foreseeable future. And that for all that time, Jerusalem has been and will remain in the crucible, being refined by the refiner's fire. Because over the course of the last 2,600 years, Jerusalem has been more, has seen more adversity than any other city on earth. The Babylonians dispersed the Jews living in Jerusalem and occupied the city themselves for about 70 years. Then in 539 BC, the city of David was occupied by the Persians. And under the Cyrus the Great, the children of Israel were, were allowed to return to Jerusalem in four waves. One under Sheshbazar, one, one under Zerubbabel, one under Ezra, and one under Nehemiah, four waves in all. But they were not given regional sovereignty. Rather, they lived in Jerusalem under Persian rule for the next 200 years. Then in 350 BC, the city revolted against Artaxerxes III, who retook the holy city and burnt it to the ground. Eighteen years later, in 332 B.C., Jerusalem capitulated to the sovereignty of Alexander the Great. Then over the course of the next 250 years, Jerusalem was invaded and occupied by various aggressors from without or from within no fewer than 21 times. Until in 63 B.C., the Roman Republic took control of the Levant and occupied the city of God. And Jerusalem remained under Roman control throughout the life and ministry of Christ. And it was in Jerusalem, specifically on the King's Dale, that the temptation of Christ, the cleansing of the temple, the meeting with Nicodemus, the healing of the man born blind, the raising of Lazarus from the dead, the triumphal entry, the Last Supper, the Passion, the crucifixion, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ, the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and the martyrdom of Stephen took place. And these events established Jerusalem as a holy city for Christianity. Then in 70 AD, the Romans laid siege to Jerusalem, destroying the whole city and the temple. But the crucible didn't stop burning in 70 AD. No, the refiner's fire continued burning as hot as ever. The city was rebuilt in 130 by Hadrian, and then it was destroyed and rebuilt again in 136, 259, 272. When under Roman rule, the city entered into a period of domestic tranquility lasting about 350 years. But this tranquility went out the window when Muhammad appeared on the scene, because he declared Jerusalem and the Temple Mount holy unto Islam in 610. And four years later, uh, Khosrau II laid siege to the city, and it came under the rule of the Sassanid Empire. In this invasion, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was burned, the Christian population was massacred, and most of the city was destroyed. Then in 629, Byzantine Emperor Herac uh, excuse me, Heraclius retook Jerusalem and returned uh, returned it to Christian control. After that, Jerusalem remained under caliphate rule for the next 240 years. However, in 878, it fell to Egypt. In 904, to the Abbasids. In 944, back to the caliphate. In 1009, uh, Fatimid Caliph al-Hakim ordered the destruction of all churches and synagogues in the empire. In 1073, Jerusalem was captured by the great Seljuk Empire. 
However, four years later, the citizens of Jerusalem revolted against these rulers, and the entire population was massacred. In 1098, the city was recaptured by the Fatimid regent. Then came the Crusades. In 1099, the first crusaders captured Jerusalem, slaughtered most of the Muslim and Jewish inhabitants, and converted the Dome of the Rock into a Christian church. And for the next 188 years, the city was governed by the Holy See of Peter in Rome, by a Latin patriarchy part of the time, and in cooperation with the Republic of Venice at a part of the time. Then in 1187, Jerusalem was captured by Saladin, and the Second Crusade failed to retake the city. In 1192, the Third Crusade under Richard the Lionhearted managed to establish a peace treaty, a peace treaty of sorts with Saladin, allowing Christian, uh, Christian pilgrims to come and go freely from Jerusalem to worship there. Despite this, the Christians in Europe continued sending crusades in an attempt to gain full control of the city. And those these, these crusades failed, they gave Frederick II the leverage he needed to negotiate a treaty with the Abayud Sultan of Egypt, placing Jerusalem under Christian control, which treaty held for 15 years, from 1229 to 1244. But after that, over the course of the next 300 years, Jerusalem fell under siege and changed hands no fewer than eight times. Then in 1516, the Ottoman Empire conquered Jerusalem and held the city in a relatively peaceful state for the next 400 years till 1917. Relatively peaceful, that is, with a few exceptions. A rebellion in 1518, an earthquake in 1546, a revolt in 1703, an incursion by Egypt in 1771, Napoleon's attempted invasion in 1799, a tax rebellion in 1825, an incursion and occupation by Egypt in 1831, which lasted till 1840, a revolt in 1834, a political takeover by France and the Vatican in 1853, the formation of the first Zionist Congress in 1897, and the Young Turk Revolution in 1908. And it was during the Ottoman occupation of Israel that the entire Palestinian region became desertified. The government imposed an oppressive tree tax, and in order to avoid the tax, everyone cut down their trees. And as a result, the entire region, which once had some of the mightiest forests in the world boasting the cedars of Lebanon, became a desert wasteland. Then in World War I, the British army defeated the Ottomans in the Battle of Jerusalem, and the city of David came under British rule, and it remained under British rule till 1947, interrupted only by an Arab incursion in 1920, a Palestinian riot in 1929, and a terrorist attack on the King David Hotel in 1946. In 1947, the United Nations enacted the UN Partition Plan, which called for the internationalization of Jerusalem as a corpus separatum. This was followed by the Palestinian Civil War in 1947, the Arab-Israeli War in 1948, the assassination of King Abdullah I of Jordan on the Temple Mount in 1951, the Six-Day War in 1967, the annexation of the Jewish Quarter in 1968, the Australian Protestant Uprising in 1969, and the assassination of Anwar Sadat in 1981, among many other events. Israel declared Jerusalem as its capital in 1947, but to this day it has never occupied the whole city, nor has it occupied the King's Dale, and the UN has refused to recognize Jerusalem as the nation's capital. And neither have the Palestinians or any of the surrounding Arab states. Even the United States, Israel's most stalwart ally, did not place its embassy in Jerusalem until 2018, because that city has been under fire under threat of fire, on a near daily basis, in the crucible, in the refiner's fire, for the last 70 years. And that brings me to the point of today's lesson. Last week I demonstrated to you how it is that our bodies are the tabernacles of eternity in the making. 
and how it is that in the meantime, we are being refined by the refiner's fire. We are being perfected as we are being consecrated unto the Lord. And how it is that our bodies, our physical bodies, are the raw material out of which our spiritual bodies will be made when we rise glorified on the last day. And I suggested that the same is true of the city of Jerusalem, that the raw material out of which the new Jerusalem will be made is the current Jerusalem, the same city that is on the news night after night because of some geopolitical conflict that is afoot in that location. And today I've told you why I think that's so. Because just as our bodies are being refined in the refiner's fire, that they may be perfected on the last day, Jerusalem is being refined in the refiner's fire, that it may be perfected on the last day. Because that's the second part of the prophecy. It isn't just that Jerusalem will be trod underfoot throughout the time of the Gentiles. It's also, and more importantly, that this ordeal is accomplishing something. This ordeal is the crucible of the refiner's fire, which is cleansing Jerusalem of its dross. Earlier I read to you from Isaiah 1, 21-28, but it says much the same in Malachi 3, 1-4. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi, and refine them like gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. And again in Zechariah 14, 8 through 11, On that day living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day the Lord will be one and his name one. The whole land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem shall remain aloft on its site from the gate of Benjamin to the place of the former gate, to the, to the corner gate, and from the tower of, Ham, of Hananel to the king's winepress. And it shall be inhabited, for there shall never again be a decree of utter destruction. Jerusalem shall dwell in security." Beloved, I'm persuaded that all these prophecies began to be fulfilled as long ago as the Babylonian exile, and that they are still being fulfilled. The sons of Levi are still being purified. The children of Israel are still in the crucible. And the city of Jerusalem is still being refined in the refiner's fire, its dross and its alloy being burned away, just as we are being refined. In the refiner's fire. And just as with us, the city of Jerusalem will be fully and finally perfected on the last day. There will be a new heaven, and a new earth, and a new you, and a new me, and a new Jerusalem. And with all this in view, I'm persuaded that Jerusalem is not just a patch of ground, but that it is holy ground. Now, we've spent five weeks covering this question, and some of you may be wondering why we've spent so much time on this. Why does it matter that Jerusalem is truly hallowed ground? Whether you believe it or not, whether you agree with me or not, why does it matter? Come back next week, and I'll tell you. That's my lesson for today.